Hi, everyone. Welcome. We're going to get started if you can uh, quiet down. All right. Well, today we're going to talk about prior authorization exclusions and what that really means. And the objectives are to identify formulary exclusions determined by health insurance payers, compare evolving trends involving formulary exclusions, including alternative funding methods, adopt the process of appealing exclusions to expand patient access. So my name is Dr. Amanda DeMarzo. I'm a licensed pharmacist. I focus on access and reimbursement and managed care. Um, I am a speaker. I speak at universities and conferences like this one. And I'm a patient advocate, and I take some patient cases pro bono throughout the year. So some of you may be familiar with this claims adjustment code, 204. It is the benefit exclusion, this service, equipment, or drug is not covered under a patient's current benefit plan. So many of you probably have received this and may have noticed that they've been increasing over the years. So we're going to talk about what to do when that happens and why it's been happening more. So the topics for discussion are what are formulary exclusions, formulary exclusion trends, alternative funding methods, impact on patient access, process for combating exclusions, characteristics of a stronger case, next steps, and engaging other stakeholders. So what are formulary exclusions? Formulary exclusions are Beyond not being on the drug list, formulary exclusions are explicitly listed as a product, service, or drug that will not be covered by a PBM for any reason. I have an asterisk here because I said without a fight. Um, I believe that there's ways to appeal, and there are ways to appeal, and it really depends on the circumstance, and we're going to go over that shortly. One step further are drug carve-outs. So with drug carve-outs, I'm sorry. Um, with drug carve-outs, it's the removal of a drug or treatment for specific disease states from a PBM standard formulary for self-funded employers. Um, it is often to save money, and the in this case, the PBM's formulary or standard formulary does not apply, and coverage is not guaranteed. The PBM justification for drug exclusions are lower costs not medically necessary? So that's one that's coming up more and more. There's non-inferior therapy available. And there are same drug class alternatives. In the Managed Healthcare Executive Journal, there was a quote saying, PBM say exclusions are necessary check on pharmaceutical industry's pricing power and a way of keeping patients and plan sponsors from having to pay for medications with high price and little if any clinical value. So I put that in there just to have you think about it as we continue this conversation um, because this is one of the, the points that's being made. So first we're going to talk about formulary exclusion trends and how they've been increasing. So in the last eight years, there's been growing formulary exclusion. It increased on average 34% per year. And from 2014 to 2022, the number of exclusions went from 109 up to 1,156. So that's a tenfold increase in eight years. The formulary exclusions are skyrocketing and if trends hold, uh, we will see more exclusions as time goes on.
Is your number the number of products that are agreed? That is the number of products. So it's the number of drug products that are excluded each year. This study, do they give any further breakdowns? We're gonna, we're gonna go over a little bit more about the breakdown, um, but they first give you the general uh, drug number for each year, and then they break it down further. I'm only gonna touch on a couple of them, but if I don't go over it, this study has a lot more of a breakdown um, at your disposal, and I'd be happy to send that to you if you reach out afterwards. So there are novel therapeutics that are also being included from PBM formulary. So that means that the new drugs that are hitting the market, the new FDA approvals, the patent, the patent secured drugs are still being excluded from formulary. And there are different ways this is happening. Um, so this is really happening because the payers have, or the PBMs or the organizations working to get exclusions are might be claiming that there are there's no medical benefit or it's a and it's it's not valid for the the treatments or it's not clinically efficacious so it really is um, a loophole and we'll go into that a little bit later but I do want to share that in 2014 there was only 50 drugs that were single source medications being excluded and in 2022 this year, there's 548. So that is, again, a tenfold increase in single source medications um, being excluded from one or more PBMs. There are drug exclusions that are targeting specific therapeutic areas. So this one I'm going to pause on for a little bit because I'm sure some of you have drugs in different disease states and you're gonna be interested on in where they fall on this chart. Um, so the top five are autonomic and central nervous system, which comes in at 16.6% .6 of the exclusions. The second one is diabetes, endocrine, metabolic, and weight loss. They're grouped together at 15.4%. Dermatological, Drugs come in at 11.1%. And number four is oncology, hematological, and antineoplastic immunosuppressant drugs at 8.6%. Um, as you can see, this is a lot of the drugs where specialties, this is really where specialty lies. Um, and that's really one of the, the challenges we see as we try to get approval for those specialty medications and those new drugs. I wanted to take a moment and focus on cancer patients. Um, since we know that pan cancer patients are usually treated a little bit more expeditious, we are still seeing that there are exclusions there. Um, in 2014, there was only one PBM excluding one drug. And then as of this year, there are three PBM, major PBMs excluding 30 or more drugs. So we're seeing that cancer patients are having difficulty getting tre cancer treatment or supportive therapies that are going to impact their care. And this is really challenging because the cancer patients are on a shorter time frame, if we're gonna consider that. And it really is comes down to, we need to make sure patients have access to care. And if we continue to see exclusions, the process that I'm going to talk about later is really hard, especially for this patient population, because time is of the essence with them and we may not have time to go through what we need to go through. Was that graph showing the, is that the number of therapies that were denied? It's the number of drugs that are being, uh, that are excluded from those three BBMs. So for CVS Caremark, it's 30 this year. For Expre Express Scripts, it's 38. And for Optum, it is 29. Um, I'm not sure, I don't have that written down for you, but I can look that up for you um, later. Yes, it also changes based on like what the demand is, um, it also plays into the rebates. Yes, the, and also it comes in down to sometimes the rebate structure. Um, so some drugs may that were excluded come back on. Um, over the course of the years, it, it does change. 
So then we're going to talk about the growing interest in carve-outs. So when we're looking at the carve-outs, we're really focusing on that self-funded employer. And they have increasing interest in explore, exploring the carve-outs to save money on health costs. So even though 61% are not currently using or exploring use, that leaves almost 40% that are using and exploring use of these carve-outs. And if just under 40% of the self-funded employers are currently using and exploring them, that's a large portion of the population. 65% of the workers that are funded for insurance are self-funded ben like benefit participants. So that's a large portion of the American population. So now we're going to go into alternative funding methods. This is a very hot topic right now. We are currently spending a good amount of time talking about it. Um, I don't think it's been getting a lot of um, airtime previously, but we're going to talk about what they are and what they do and what the results are. So alternative funding methods are organizations or programs that are excluding drugs from the formulary or carving out that specific drug to exclu exclusively take advantage of patient assistance programs. So in theory, that sounds great. We're trying to get patients on drug, but this is the self-funded employers who are actively taking that drug off their formulary, even if they can and previously have paid for it, so that they no longer have to pay for it. And it moves the, it really shifts the money and the cost to the patient and the manufacturers. Um, what they do is they really remove the drugs from the benefit and then exploit the free and assisted drug programs provided by nonprofit organizations and manufacturers. And, excuse me, what was that? We're talking about all drugs. Yeah. Yes. 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 So we are talking about all the drugs that are in here. We're seeing more uh, specialty drugs falling into this where they're using the alternative funding methods to just exclude different drugs from the formulary to then take advantage of patient assistance programs. And patient assistance programs are usually for the high cost drugs that are and a lot of the time newer drugs that are on the market um, to help patients who need to afford to help affording it. Um, so there are programs for other drugs as well, but you'd have to research which individual disease state has which programs. Um, so we're going to go into the different op options for patient assistance in a little bit. Um, but this alternative funding method is really focusing on removing the cost from the payers, whether it's self-funded employers or the exclusions for um, large PBMs, and then they are really shifting the cost to manufacturers and patients, depending on what the model is later. So they can utilize some of the, the other cost savings programs that they implement, and they can uh, group them together and make it really expensive for the patient. So this really does um, violate the spirit of the patient assistance programs with the loopholes they've created by implementing a carve out. So the companies that implement these programs sometimes refer to this process as classifying certain drugs as non-essential health benefits, which is a loophole in the Affordable Care Act regulatory requirements because if it is a essential health benefit, it has to be covered. But you can also classify something as non-essential if you can prove it or say that. So they can really get around um, getting the coverage for a new drug if they do that. Patient assistance programs were created to help patients who genuinely could not afford the cost of care. So drug carve-outs used in this way a lot some of the patient assistance money to financially capable payers when it was intended for those patients who can genuinely cannot afford the medication. So underinsured or uninsured for this medication may be exploited just to get some savings for the payer. And the real 
people that are impacted are the patients. They are getting delays in care. They're paying more for drugs. They're confused about their coverage because some of these policies are very confusing for what their monthly responsibility is. Um, and then they're unsure about who can help. And they're more likely to abandon therapy because it can be so difficult to navigate. As we go through this, um, I want you to keep in mind that the, the patient is really the one that's being harmed in all of this. Um, employers are purposely removing the drugs from their formulary because there is a safety net of a patient assistance program to help their employees. The federal law, ERISA, exempts self-funded plans established by private employers from most state insurance laws. So you mentioned Texas. This is one of the ones that um, can get around it. I will get into that shortly. You're reading my mind. Um, like I said earlier, 64% of covered workers were self-funded in 2021. So that's a large portion of the American population that is insured. They target small to mid-sized employers. Um, the smaller population can be impacted by expensive medications because only 4% of the population is really impacted by specialty medications, those really high cost drugs. Um, so that's an easy target for them to carve out because if only one or two of their employees is impacted, they're more likely to just say, we're not going to cover it. And that's really hard for the employees because it makes it harder for them to have the options. And then there's downstream costs that come with that. So um, if they're not well controlled, they could have more hospitalizations, progression of disease. And then there's more costs later on for the, the patient and employer. They also may specifically target, target employers that have employees within the eligibility criteria criteria for the free drug programs and the patient assistance programs. Um, by this, I mean the employee salaries are either publicly available or the average is below the eligibility criteria. This is smart on their part because then there's fewer patients that are being left out of them carving it out, um, but there's still some patients that are likely not getting therapy. When you couple this with other cost containment strategies, it can be very expensive for the patient. So this can be coupled with self-funded employers with accumulators and maximizers. So accumulators and maximizers are a huge topic right now too. Um, and patients are the ones that are going to be taking the most of the cost with those programs. And then if you couple it with this, they might really be limited to their options. And as you asked, these are the companies that some of the companies that offer specialty drug carve outs and or the alternative funding methods. This is a non exhaustive list of organizations. And as I said before, some of these companies are calling it the non essential health benefits. So they are classifying the drugs as non essential health benefits, and that's how they're getting around it. Um, I would like to say. Uh, anecdotally, I did some research into some of these companies, and um, when you go far enough back into who created them, some of them were part of the inception of patient assistance programs, and now they know they built it up, so now they're exploiting it in their consultancy. So it's important to keep in mind what is happening here um, and what the intentions are. Some of these companies also couple the carve outs with a few other me methodologies. So some of them are foreign drug acquisition from either Canada or other sources, and that can add time or safety implications. Canada usually has safe medications, but they are also sourcing from other places that might not have the same safety requirements that the US does. Um, is it true that they charge about 30% of what the medicine would have cost? So it depends on the program. So some programs are charging the employers, the employer groups, 
just a flat rate of what they'd provide for changing the formula and carving it out. Some of them charge a percentage of the money saved. So that really comes down to however much money they saved the um, employer that year based on the previous year, um, they'll take a cut of that. And then some of them will also, in addition to those two methods, charge patients for applying into the free programs. So that becomes a bigger challenge and really difficult, especially for those in pharma, because it's a free program with free applications. And if there's companies that are um, saying that you need to pay to apply, it makes it very confusing for the patient because one person is saying that they need to pay while other people are saying it's free. So it can get very confusing very fast. Um, so it really depends on which, which organization we're talking about, how they make their money, but they are getting some kind of compensation for doing this. Um, and more frequently, they're taking a cut of what it is. So 30% um, is one of the, the numbers that I've seen. Um, I've seen other numbers as well. Um, it really comes down to the, the individual company and what they're offering. Because like I said, they will group it with other services like foreign drug acquisition or um, some of them will add that financial navigator into it and have some people on their team that talk to the patients. Um, some of them will reach out to doctor's offices directly and they will try to get the patient information directly from the office. And sometimes they sound official, so it can be a challenge to really identify who you're talking to over the phone and giving this information to. So those are just, yes, it is difficult and there, this it does lead to potential HIPAA violations if you're not sure of what or who you're speaking to. And then in other cases, they will ask the patient to get their own information from the doctor's office and then just send it to the company to do the application for them. So it can get confusing for the patient, difficult. There's a lot of hands where the information is going through. So it isn't always the, in the best interest of privacy protection. So why is this a problem? We kind of already talked about this, but I want to really make the points here. Um, they may charge the patients for applying to those free programs. They may charge the PBNs, insurers, or self-funded employers for the service, and they may take a percentage of the money saved. Ultimately, this really leaves the patients behind. They, patients have less access to the medications. The patients are not eligible for the patient assistance programs in some cases. There are many patients who are having delays in their therapy and they have, there are, there's profiting off of these free programs and that's against the spirit of why they were really created. Um, the patients are suffering, they're suffering monetarily, emotionally, mentally, clinically, and it really is difficult to make sure the patients are being put first, especially when there are these players. So what can you do? You can stay vigilant. You can be mindful of who you're sharing that patient information with. You can be aware of these programs and what they're saying and combat them directly. So Manufacturer free and discounted drug programs are free for patients to apply to. Do not forget that. Make sure that everyone knows, that the office knows, the patient knows, that they, can, they are free to apply. Advocate for the patient. Understand the options and be the advocate for them because they really do need assistance in their, their journey for care. And it really does help when they have an advocate on their side.
the impact on patient access. So exclusions are restricting patient access. The limitations to single source medications limits the patient's ability to access novel therapeutics, some of which may have better results or provide options for patients who have tried many step therapy, fail first therapies, or therapies that were really experimental and just an effort to make them feel better. Um, there's variability in the exclusions from payer to payer, and that can lead to gaps in patient care um, just because there's a lack of information or if a patient changes jobs or health plans. A medication that has been optimal or had successful results in the past can become excluded in the same health plan year to year, and that can be difficult because then the patient has to start the process over. And then non-medical switching could lead to suboptimal or dangerous multi-drug regimens, especially in complex conditions that have treatments that interact with other drugs. Um, and there, I, it really comes down to, um, I would say, a lot of the, the high-touch disease states have a lot of drug regimens that, that can have interactions. And if there isn't someone that's maintaining the patient's profile and medication list, um, it's, it's something that could fall through the crack. The direct patient impact is the lack of really a decrease in continuity of care and a decrease of quality of care. So now we have the process for combating exclusions. The initial steps really come down to what we always know, prior authorization and then appeal. The prior authorization is really needed um, because you need an initial denial to do anything. You need to get that 204 and then you need to take next steps. That's just what it is, um, and a paper trail is needed. So making sure that you're documenting everything that's happening and making sure that you're keeping copies for yourself at the office and for the patient so that everyone has multiple copies will help the next steps because you will have to take the appeal to another level where it will likely have to go to an external appeal. The appeals, the Affordable Care Act requires that all consumers have the right to appeal denied claims. Um, I always recommend including a letter of medical necessity from the prescriber. Um, that always is a stronger case than one without. In this case, especially if you know that the payer had said that they said that it's non-essential health benefit, if you can use essential health benefit or health essential medication and then cite the, AC, uh, the Affordable Care Act regulatory requirements for essential health benefits um, from the provider's clinical perspective, that might also help your case because you have a clinician saying that it's an essential health benefit or an essential health care treatment, um, and then using that term and citing the law can help. You include research and journal articles that state the value of the desired therapy. So if you don't know where to find these, you can really engage the manufacturers and if you work in an office you can engage their medical affairs teams and medical science liaisons and they would be able to help your provider find that resource the resources can be found in a lot of places and there's a lot of research out there about each drug that you can utilize in these um, appeals to really support your case you can also include any therapies failed so saying that the clinical guidelines say to take X amount of drugs in this order before trying this drug, and you say they failed, and you say why they failed or why they're contraindicated in that patient um, can also support your case. And then you want to include any justifications for why drugs on the formulary are not appropriate and haven't been successful. So you want to just go over all of the different scenarios that can come back. The importance of creating a paper trail really comes down to accountability and creating data. The accountability really holds stakeholders accountable when pursuing this appeals process. You don't want to lose any documentation, and you'll likely have to go through the external appeals process. So showing that each time you tried to reach out to them and get this approved um, shows that you've, you've really been putting in your best effort, and you might have not have getting the same result. I also recommend every time you call, every time you send something to someone, document it because it shows that you've been putting in a greater effort than they have um, and it might help your case. And then creating data, so tracking the demand and denials for a drug can contribute to changes in the formulary year after year. 
And this one's a little bit more abstract, but I always recommend doing this because payers want to know what's being denied. Pharma wants to know what's being denied and how much, and they use that information to help get the drug on formulary. They're saying the, the patients want it, the providers want it, let's work together to get it for them. So pharma can use that information to inc of increased demand to negotiate a way to be on the health plan's formulary, and then health plans could evaluate demand to also neg negotiate better rebates. Um, while we may not like rebates, this can help us if we want to make sure that it gets on formulary. So the data really can help that in an abstract way. It really does help the pharma companies and the health plans to have those conversations or at least initiate those conversations. So a denial still does something. Um, it does take time and I know that offices are really busy so it can be difficult if you know it's going to get denied but for the right patient and if you have the resources it's worthwhile to get that denial because it can change the outcome for patients in the future. The additional option for self-funded health plans um, is also called the compassionate appeal. So patients can go to their employers and ask for a compassionate appeal. They can have a direct conversation with HR or those who manage the plan. Um, they're usually executives. They might be the chief financial officer. It could be human resources. Sometimes it's the CEO, depending on how big the company is. They really are not looking at, based on what I've been told for people who have been in this position and making these decisions on the cost of the health plan year after year, they're not really looking at the specifics. They're just seeing if they're saving money. They're not looking at what's getting cut off the formulary. They're not seeing how many patients are impacted, really. They might have a presentation from the payer or the PBM or the organization working on this, but as long as the numbers look better year after year, they don't really mind what's happening as long as it has a positive spin when you're presenting it to them. So if you go and have a conversation with HR, the executives involved, just know that the patients will likely have to share the health information with them, and that's a decision that they'll have to make because that can be very personal and it can lead to other conversations, um, which are protected, but it, uh, bias happens regardless of what hap what you're saying. So um, it's important to just be aware that you'd be sharing health information with an employer or a representative of the employer. And then when you're making a stronger case to the employer, you really wanna provide data about downstream costs. So it's not just about saying like, I need this drug, it's gonna make me feel better. You really wanna say, it impacts my ability to do my job. It, it really helps me go forth and be the most effective I can. And then you also want to say the, you want to cite, I always say cite research on anything that you provide to someone, um, but it, you can also provide the cost of trial and error. So the fail first and step first therapies have a lot of research out there that you can use to support what you're going to say to your employer. So you can say, trial and error is gonna cost more. I'm going to more, doctor, more doctors, more doctor visits, I'm trying more drugs. All the drugs have variable costs. If it doesn't work in a couple of weeks, I'm gonna start another drug. And then you're just gonna to have to pay for a lot of that. Um, and at that rate, I might hit my out-of-pocket maximum and then you have to just pay for everything. Um, you can also talk about the fail first protocol. So how many drugs have you failed previously? Do we need to try those again, according to what the payer wants? Um, also adherence issues. If it's not working, there's going to be challenges with actually taking the medication and actually seeing results. And then the costs related to disease, disease progression, or it's gonna be a big one. If you can find data on that and show them that long-term, this could be expensive, but this is not a process for everyone. Um, you're going to be building a case of why it's more expensive. And that's, while it might help you right now, um, it might not help you in the future. So it's this is one way you can do it. Um, I've seen 
I've talked to some HR professionals who have approved compassionate use cases. They are usually also a little bit more flexible to the emotional response. So you can write a letter that really um, shares your experience and they might be more willing to, to approve it just based on what you've been through. You, it's your coworker. It's usually a coworker that you're sending this to, and they may be. You may already have a relationship with them, so that could be used to an advantage when you're trying to get enough compassionate appeal. The characteristics that enhance a case: previous use had pro positive results. So, if you've been on a different insurance plan, or you, they recently. Um, changed it to an exclusion, you can appeal to get it approved based on previous experience. Um, so that allows you to say, this has worked before, nothing else works this well, and it's really going to be the only thing that um, is gonna work at the moment. So we can revisit the conversation, but for right now with what's available on the market, this is what has the best quality of life. There may not be any other treatment options. So like I said earlier, there's single source medications that are, are being excluded. And with those, what are the other options for these, these patients? Well, there might not be any other options for these patients. So that might also enhance the case. Uh, for those single source medications, there probably are some alternatives, whether they're as efficacious is really um, up to what the clinical information says, but you can make the case that this is more clinically efficacious and that the drug is really the only option that's going to help this patient. Um, all the other alternatives were tried and failed. You may also be able to get the medication approved and have a formulary exclusion exemption. And then the drug was not previously excluded, but now is, is also a really good case for appeal and getting that exemption because the patient was doing well on the medication and then they can go and try to get it um, approved for, even though it's excluded for new members, they might be able to be grandfathered in. So next steps, helping the patients understand their coverage and next steps really comes down to informing patients about their costs early in the treatment process. We want to empower patients with shared decision making. So have the pro provider and the patient talking about how they're going to proceed with their, their treatment and how they're going to afford it and really be upfront, I guess, about the, the implications and the, the process of getting something like this approved. It does take time and there are options to help the patient, whether it's the patient assistance programs, um, but there, it does take time and there may be delays in therapy. There, you wanna explore the patient assistance options. There's more than just manufacturer programs. There's nonprofit organizations, charitable organizations that are available. Discuss health plan structures and the varying pricing set by programs. This one's a little bit more difficult depending on what the program is. So self-funded employers, um, their programs are a little bit more complex. If you're putting the alternative funding methods with the accumulators and maximizers, the copay can be very difficult to figure out, especially if they're seeking out care in other areas. So if they're getting more than one medication, they go to the pharmacy frequently, they go to the doctor frequently. Understanding that payment amount can be very difficult. Um, and it would be, I would say difficult for most people to kind of calculate it by hand or trying to figure that out. So educating the patient that there are variable costs with the medication when that scenario is happening. You wanna follow up regularly with patients to maintain coverage. You wanna engage prescriber to create a case for approval. So the medical necessity, a letter of why it's clinically important for the patient to have. Seek out additional support. So reach out to your financial navigators, reach out to other resources that are available. Um, ask a friend, there's always someone that knows what or has been in that situation before. So crowdsourcing the information is a good way to figure it out and problem solve and then apply for additional funding. As we go through, we can improve awareness about patient assistance programs and funding. So there are three major types of 
funding that's available. There's manufacturer programs, nonprofit organizations, and government programs. Depending on eligibility, they can really go for any of them. One of the highly marketed areas of additional patient support is manufacturer programs. This includes the copay card programs, the free drug programs, starter programs, bridge programs. There are also programs with the government, so the low income subsidy program, which can help Medicare patients. Um, those Medicare patients would have to have low income to qualify. There's point of purchase discounts. There are prescription drug discounts. There are state pharmaceutical assistance programs. There are nonprofit and charitable organizations, which include the patient advocacy organizations, independent co pay assistance funds, hospital and practice based charities, or financial assistance programs at hospitals. There are religious charities. There's prescription drug assistance programs. Some organizations, nonprofit, charitable, or government can provide assistance for additional resources, including travel, housing, um, food. So if I always promote helping the patient as a whole, not just with the drug costs. So the patient has other expenses in their life. Can you reallocate some of the expenses so that it makes sense for the drug? So for example, if we have a patient who has a fixed income because they're uh, a senior and they have a certain number of expenses for housing, they pay for food, food can be a variable cost and they have their drugs. If we can help them get on additional savings programs for their other drugs, they might have more money to pay for the expensive one. Um, there's also food banks or senior food programs locally for a lot of different communities. Um, there are religious charities that can provide transportation, housing assistance, and then food assistance as well. So it's looking at the whole person rather than just how do we get the patient on the drug. It's really um, a holistic approach to helping the patient up with their affordability. And then engaging other st stakeholders. I always recommend engaging as many people as possible to help with these issues. We're not siloed in working on these problems. We're not siloed in working with patients. There are a lot of resources out there for you to take advantage of. With manufacturers, I always recommend reaching out to field reimbursement managers. They're really helpful for offices to navigate what's happening in reimbursement, especially for specific drugs. If you know that you're having trouble with a specific drug, reach out to the manufacturer. They probably have someone that can assist you and help you get patients on medication. Then patient support hubs are also there to help the patient do the financial navigation, help them get on the programs, help them get other programs. I know some of the patient support programs provide nutritional support or other resources, so really take advantage of those programs. Specialty pharmacies, more and more of them are getting patient or financial assistance coordinators to help with this piece. So if you have a specialty pharmacy you use, ask if they have someone that's in this role that can help because that can make a really big difference, especially since they're in the pharmacy, they can help you navigate the costs involved at their pharmacy. So they know what it's going to cost. They know how they can do coupons or they can work with patient assistance programs with the manufacturers or nonprofits. They, they've worked with a lot of other patients, so they know some of the, the other things going on. They also have an entire pharmacy team at specialty pharmacies. They can help with some of the questions that are involved. They are working with these patients on a day-to-day -day basis, so they are also a resource. And then I also have tech companies here. Tech companies can implement technology to help you speed up the process, fix the process in some cases, or streamline the process and communication. So you, engaging all of these stakeholders will be really beneficial for an individual office to really get those results and see those positive outcomes that we really want for patients. So thank you for listening and I think we've covered a lot of different topics today. Are there any questions? Yes. We have, we have some products that they are approved to be administered and only that our physicians would turn in the office. 
And so to me, it's, it's not technically an exclusion, but it, you know, any insights on? Uh, you know, yes. So the that? so the question is um, the allergy and immunology space. There are drugs that are self-administered or um, the payer prefers self-administered so that it goes through specialty pharmacy while the providers prefer buy and bill. Um, that's not an exclusion. That's just a preference for the specialty pharmacy. Um, we're seeing more white and brown and clear bagging happening, um, and that's really not going to go away because vertical integration has really led to um, improved profitability for these organizations. So they're going to push as many patients as possible to these organizations um, because that's how they make more money. They own the organization they're pushing it to. Um, when it comes to buy and bill versus specialty pharmacy, when it is self-administered, um, a lot of the times you can't get around the specialty pharmacy piece of it. What you might be able to do if the, since you work in allergy and immunology, if that person is prone to severe allergic reactions, you can probably get the first dose in office as buy and bill. So at least you're making something on new starts. Um, and that's because you can just say, Clinic, you'd have to do a prior authorization for it, but you'd have to say clinically we don't want to do them to do the first one or two at home just because they are prone to allergic reactions, um, and then apply for it and try to get buy and bill through that just because that can be severe reaction for your allergy and immunology patients. So that's one way you can do it. Um, buy and bill versus pharmacy benefit. I would say there are others that are way more informed about this um, that would be could dive really deep with you um, i know some but i would say the expert would be elizabeth johnson so go to her and ask her very specific questions i'm sure she'll love it um, but i can answer some questions but she really does it day in and day out with the buy and bill so she would be the one to talk to are there any questions What's your thought on um, cases where there is a, I'm just going to say, bridge program that the manufacturer provides so that the patient can take advantage of while the authorization is being processed? Because knowing that the authorization may or may not have approved the patient ultimately, is it advisable for the provider to engage on the bridge program, get started on therapy, and then find out whoops, you didn't get Okay, so the question was, what is my opinion on bridge programs? Because it provides drug to patients um, when they're working on the approval process with their payer, and the drug might not be approved at the end. So this one is a special case that I think is valuable. So one of the, the benefits of a bridge program is you could start to see benefits, clinical improvement with bridge programs. Um, if they're long enough. And how I would utilize that personally in this scenario is I would then go back and add more information to the case while they're approving it and say there's clinical benefit and we're seeing improved result, clin improved clinical results with this drug that we haven't seen with the alternatives that we've tried and have the provider write that in a medical necessity letter. Um, and that's really how you're going to do it because if you've had previous positive results from a drug a payer is reluctant but a little bit more willing to pay for it than if they've never tried it before so it's still going to be a battle don't get me wrong it's going to be a challenge but there is if there's no other options that patient has and they've gone through all of the options available to them and you're really trying to get them on this it might be the way to go are there any other questions? Yes. In alternative funding model. So I had a scenario recently where there was a valid PA on file. So the patient had already received drugs. Then the PBM tried to steer via a benefit coordinator or a patient advocate 